Well, welcome everyone to what will no doubt be another great night here in New York. I'm Bud Mishkin, and I'm so pleased and privileged to be your host tonight. The basic rundown will be a list of great, eloquent, humble speakers <laughs> telling stories. It will most definitely be a night of stories. Uh, we have a special musical guest, and at the end of all of it, Shouldn't be a total loss. We have something to drink, something to eat, time for schmoozing. So please stay with us till the end and enjoy. I've been blessed to interview and profile a lot of fascinating people in New York. Occasionally I'll be asked, who was the most interesting interview? Obviously an impossible question to answer, but if I did try to answer, let's just say that Pete Hamill would be in that conversation. Yeah. I first interviewed him in 2004 for a one-on-one -on -one profile series that I created at New York One. Uh, as he talked about his craft, he told me that he liked sentences with a good hard word at the end, sentences that didn't need punctuation. For example, you would never write, I threw a rock at him. You wouldn't write that. You would write, I hit him with a rock. Every week, while trying to write the script for some 400 one-on-one -on -one profiles over 14 years, I would ask myself, what would Pete do? <laughs> I hosted him several times at the 92nd Street Y, both individually and at other times with other New York icons, one of whom joins us tonight, Gay Talese. And <laughs> along with Liz Smith and Calvin Trillin, the night was called New York Stories, and Pete had a thousand of them. And that might be an understatement. Like the Grammy Award he won in 1975 for writing the liner notes to his friend's album. The, f the, the album, it's true, Blood on the Tracks. The friend, some guy named Bob Dylan. But the story Pete loves to tell about that is not the fact that he won the award, was that his young daughters at the time, living in Brooklyn with him, were playing catch with the Grammy Award one day. <laughs> Their dad may have loved Pee Wee Reese. Their daughters did not catch like him. <laughs> the award landed on the floor and broke, and Pete kept it that way, and he said he loved that because that his daughters had put their mark on the Grammy. Or the time that Pete saw a writer that he knew a little bit in a bookstore, Philip Roth. He told me that he saw Roth in the bookstore taking his books on the bottom shelf <laughs> and putting them at eye level. This is Philip Roth we're talking about. He sold a couple of books. Roth noticed Pete, came over, and said, please don't tell anybody what you just saw. <laughs> to which Pete replied, Philip, look where I am. I'm in the H's. <laughs> These are cherished memories for me, and no doubt in this audience, I know that I am not alone. Pete, of course, loved the Brooklyn Dodgers, another understatement. I once took him to lunch in Brooklyn with Michael Shapiro, who had written an interesting book called The Last Good Season that essentially made the case that it was Robert Moses and not the hated Walter O'Malley, who should be blamed for the Dodgers leaving Brooklyn. <laughs> Pete listened. Michael made his case, thoughtfully and diligently. And at the end of the lunch, Pete's response, if I may paraphrase, no. <laughs> we have a list of speakers tonight that is akin to the great 1955 Brooklyn Dodgers lineup. We're going to run through them real quickly right now, and they'll be speaking to you in a couple of minutes. First of all, from the New York Times, and he gets extra applause because he's the man who's worked so hard to put this night together, Dan Barry. <laughs> Author James McBride. The man synonymous with the New York Daily News still, Mike Lupica. From the Post, the News, Joanna Malloy. The great Times columnist, Jim Dwyer. A staple on MSNBC and formerly of the Globe and the Herald in a city where they now have won so many championships they don't know what to do with them. Mike Barnacle. 
One of my favorite colleagues uh, from my New York One days, and of course from the New York Times, Sam Roberts. <laughs> Pulitzer Prize winner, columnist, speechwriter for President Reagan, Peggy Noonan. <laughs> if my daughter were here, 15 years old, she'd be like, oh, that's great, that's great, that's great. Carl Hyacin's here. <laughs> The founder, CEO, and editor of the Grand Truth Project, Charles Sennett. And uh, columnist, and of course, Pete's brother, Dennis Hamlin. Now again, after all the speeches, uh, we'll, there'll be a, a musical performance uh, by a special guest who I am happy to say sounds better than ever. To start off our evening, please welcome the director of the NYU Glucksman, Ireland House, Professor Kevin Kenny. So, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this. Uh, very special occasion as we honor uh, Pete Hamill. It's, it's um, so wonderful uh, for me as the new director of Glaxman Ireland House uh, to participate in this. Uh, Bud mentioned the words uh, great, um, eloquent, and what was the, uh, and humble. Uh, uh, of those three, I will choose to be humble uh, and I will be Brief. I just want to say a, a few thank yous, and I want to tell you a little bit about uh, our program as we're uh, hosting the evening. Uh, so uh, I'd especially like to welcome uh, Ted Conover of the NYU uh, Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute, one of our co-sponsors uh, this evening, um, the Heyman Center for the Humanities at Columbia University, and the members of the Glaxman Ireland House Advisory Board. Um, I'll say just a few words about our uh, program in Ireland House uh, for those who are not familiar because Pete has been a mainstay of that program uh, since the beginning. Ireland House was created in 1993 uh, through the generosity and vision of Lou Glaxman and Loretta Brennan Glaxman as the university's interdisciplinary center for the study of Ireland, Irish America, and the Irish diaspora. Uh, since then, Ireland House has become one of the leading Irish study centers in the world, a refuge for all New Yorkers with an interest in things Irish, and a welcoming home at One Washington Muse uh, for visitors from all corners of the world. As part of our 20, uh, 25th anniversary celebrations this year, Terry Galway has written a beautifully illustrated history of Ireland House, being New York, being Irish, uh, with essays and poetry by many of the leading figures who've spoken there over the years. Uh, I mention this uh, not only because the, se the holiday season is upon us, and the book is out there, uh, but also because it's a very good book. Among our board members in Glucksman Ireland House, uh, since the inception of the program, uh, we've been fortunate enough to count Pete Hamill, and we are simply delighted to be able to honor him with this evening's tribute. Uh, and so in my new capacity as director of Glucksman Ireland House, I just joined NYU three months ago, uh, I'm honored uh, to kick off this evening's proceedings uh, by turning things over now to somebody who knows Pete well, and that's Dan Barry. Thank you. I'd like to uh, read something I wrote a couple of years ago for another event celebrating Pete. Uh, so yes, in keeping with longstanding newspaper tradition, I will now plagiarize myself. <laughs> I call this work Scones for Pete Hamill. The other morning I went downtown to see Pete Hamill. I like saying that. I went downtown to see Pete Hamill. Anyway, I call Pete Hamill 
Did I mention that it was Pete Hamill I was going to see? <laughs> and I ask him, hey, Pete, Pete Hamill, can I bring anything? He says, don't bother, really. And I say, are you sure? And he says, don't worry. And I say, come on. And he says, half-heartedly, in that voice of his, maybe some scones. <laughs> scones. And I am thinking, scones for Pete Hamill. It will be my distinct honor. If you do not know what I mean by me saying it would be my distinct honor, then you do not belong here tonight. You do not belong in this city tonight or ever. There is the door. This is because the rest of us know that so many things are stipulated by just saying Pete Hamill. It means world-class writing infused with a working-class ethos. It means observation and analysis that comes always from the default position of compassion. It means being tough when necessary, but never cruel. And it means that voice. That voice seasoned by neighborhood bars and sobriety, by Gleason's gym and the White House, by mafia comedy and Vietnam tragedy, by Ireland and Brooklyn, Mexico and Japan, a voice that is weathered but never weary, a singular, immediate, and identifiable New York baritone. If the pavement of this city could speak, it would sound like Pete Hamill. You can applaud there if you like. <laughs> Pete Hamill, who wanted scones. And I'm going to find him scones, damn it. Now it's raining hard, so I duck into the Starbucks on Chambers Street, which has three of the sorriest ass scones I have ever seen. They look like mistakes from an Easy Bake oven. But I buy them. Pete wants scones. Then I head back out into the rain, determined to find scones that are worthy. <laughs> Along West Broadway, I pass some workers delivering balloons to a novelty store, a well-dressed man whose umbrella pops inside out, a nanny determined to keep the child she's responsible for safe and dry. As I walk, I think of those days when Pete Hamill and Jimmy Breslin spoke for the city. I think of Pete's memoir, A Drinking Life, the vivid portraits of a distant Brooklyn, and the struggles of his Irish immigrant parents. I think of all his magazine profiles and his many novels, including Snow in August, Forever, and North River, each one conveying his profound knowledge and familial love for this city. Mostly, I think of Pete Hamill, the newspaper man. I'm haunted by a column he wrote for the Village Voice once after a cab he was a passenger in struck and killed an old man. He describes the police activity, the man's hat on the ground, and a woman hurrying past, oblivious to the scene. He ends the piece with, a gust of wind lifts the dead man's sporty little hat and rolls it back against the curb. Notice those words, sporty little hat. That line reminds me of the profound impact that Pete had and continues to have on newspaper types like me. For example, Jim Dwyer and I recently joked about how, as kids, we couldn't wait to reach drinking age so that we could join Pete Hamill at the lion's head. Of course, by the time we were of age, Pete had stopped drinking. <laughs> Which, if you ask me, was pretty inconsiderate. <laughs> Joanne Wasserman hasn't forgotten Pete's help in editing a story she had written about her son, Sam, who has attention deficit disorder. A few months later, shortly after his mother died, Pete did a reading at Sam's school, the children's school in Park Slope. And it seemed with, that all of Brooklyn had turned out to greet him and to say with affection, Pete, I knew your mother. Clyde Haberman remembers walking into the Daily News with Pete on his first day as that newspaper's editor back in 1997, where the newsroom's security guard greeted him with, good morning, Mr. Hammond. <laughs> and Pete just laughed because as Clyde wrote, Pete took his work seriously, not himself. Clyde, who, if you know him, is not one for Irish sentiment, 
said this about Pete, simply, I worship the man. Whether you were a fledgling hack on her way up or an old rewrite man on his way out, Pete encouraged you, treated you to small kindnesses, made you feel as though you mattered. We children of immigrants know that what I'm about to say is the highest of compliments. Pete Hamill never forgot where he came from. Oh Christ, those scones. <laughs> those scones for Pete Hamill. Finally, I find a precious cafe with better scones, and now I am carrying six scones, six, to Pete Hamill. My back hurts from the load. <laughs> he and his gracious wife, Fukiko, welcome me into the library that is their home. I present them with my three best scones, two blueberry scones and a cranberry orange scone. And Pete decides that he'll have a croissant. <laughs> But we talk about our Irish parents and our shared love for comic strips and about writing. Pete, you'll be glad to know, had just gotten off another deadline. Then Pete says to me in that tossed off oracular way of his, he says, there is always surprise in life if you pay attention. I write it down. As I walk back to the subway, I remember all that I had seen this morning. The man with the broken umbrella, the nanny, the delivery of some balloons, and one of the very best writers and people of our time telling us all to pay attention and embrace the surprise of life. So, thank you, Pete Hamill. Sure. Uh, my name is James McBride, and um, I apologize, Pete, that I have, I'm a single dad, so I have to leave right after. But, um, you know, I was in the green room with a bunch of Irishmen, you know, which was very, they, you see they put me and Mike together, put the Irish, and the, I mean the black guy and the Italian, they threw us in the same. You know, I was in the green room, it was like slum, you know, suffering is good, money is bad. I mean, I didn't know what was happening, it was just, it was a feeling all over. <laughs> but, you know, um, <laughs> You know, I learned from, from Malachi. I, to I toured Australia with Malachi McCourt once, many years ago. And I learned the danger. How are you, Malachi? Yes, uh, you still owe me some money. I lost a lot of money because of you. Cause I learned the danger of, uh, of trying to tell a story with an Irishman. You were going to get your feelings hurt. I don't care. You could be a blend of Charlie Parker and Martin Luther King. You're not going to outdo an Irishman when it comes to telling a story. So I have no stories to tell, but rather I have a poem. Deep in the jungle where the coconut grows, up jumped Pete Hamill wearing a one-button roll. He wore keen-toed shoes and a split in his coat. He was a sharp little fella, and that ain't no joke. Walking through the jungle one bright sunny day, a big brown bear got in his way. Pete said, get out my way, bear, and let me pass for I take my stick shift foot and put it in your automatic boom. <laughs> he kept through the jungle that bright sunny day, a big, mean lion got in his way. Pete said, hey, Mr. Lion, I thought you was king. I just found out you ain't a thing. He said, the elephant talked about your mama, put your daddy on the shelf, said some stuff I'm scared to repeat myself. The lion said, shut up, shut up, Pete, say no more. If the elephant's in his house, I'm kicking down his door. The, elephant, the lion swept through the jungle like a wind in a breeze, knocking over tigers and slapping down trees, humbling long-legged giraffes to, his, to their knees. He spied the elephant under a coconut tree. He said, rise up, you long-nosed, stinking Republican elephant. Your butt belongs to me. <laughs> the elephant rose like a sweeping tide. Every animal in the jungle ran, the running high. The lion stepped back and made a bitchin' pass. The elephant sidestepped and kicked him dead in the center of his doink. They kept, they fought all night and they fought all day. And nothing in the jungle knows how that lion got away. He went through the jungle more dead than alive. And that's when Pete Hamill started that Irish signifying jive. He said, hey, Mr. Lion, I thought you was king. But I just found out you ain't a thing. And anyway, don't you roar, because I'll come down out this tree and kick your butt some more. <laughs> Pete jumped up. Pete jumped down. His foot missed the limb, and his rear end hit the ground. Like a blast of, like a strike of lightning, a wave of heat, the lion was on Pete with all four feet and was grinding poor Pete into sausage meat. 
Pete looked up with tears in his eyes. He said, Mr. Lyon, Mr. Lyon, I apologize. I've been slaving like a dog amidst the black and the Jews, scratching out my column in the New York Daily News. All my associates are bums like me, so-called leprechauns of Irish peasantry. They tell you themselves, but they're all in jail. Cops who write poetry and judges, judges who now deliver mail. I've had more jobs than a Haitian. I've worked harder than the Chinese nation. I've been an artist, novelist, essay, and soda jerk. I've toiled in steels and canvas and done the Irish work. I'd go to Hong Kong if I could get paid, but even the Irish deserve to get laid. That takes time, sir. <laughs> Pete looked up expecting to see the lion roaring, instead saw the king of jungle was snoring. <laughs> so Pete slung away and lived a long life of labor to become our most favorite storytelling neighbor. He's the legend that lived next door, whose work represents every dream we've ever had. A man of extraordinary talent, great gifts. Look at this great city, when it was once New York that we all knew. When he talked about the blacks and the whites and the Jews and the poor people, when we were all family. And I looked and I talked to him after the election, and I saw the distress in his face about what this country has become. But I, sp I speak for all of us, Pete, when I say we will not forget. We remember. We will not forget. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Dr. Miriam Nighan Gray, and to follow in the footsteps of Dan Barry and uh, James McBride is intimidating, to say the least. I have some messages here from some people uh, that I just wanted to share before we got further into the program. Um, the first one is from Gloria Steinem. I had the great luck of meeting Pete Hamill soon after I found refuge in the People's Republic of New York. We were in a group of writers, Tom Wolfe, Jimmy Breslin and more, who were helping Clay Felker start New York Magazine. It was the first ever city magazine and there was a lot of scepticism. Also, the New Yorker was mad at us for our title and we took, all took turns at, as we put it, tap dancing for rich people in order to help Clay raise money. But I was from East Toledo, the only girl writer, as Jimmy Breslin put it, and I felt like the odd person out. What made all the difference was that Pete Hamill treated me like a person and a friend. I remember that we compared working class Brooklyn to working class Toledo and talked canasta and poker, loan sharks and paycheck loans, different kinds of highballs and high schools from which girls got married and guys went to work in factories. Pete too had quit high school and worked in a shipyard before he decided to go to college. Finally, even Jimmy Breslin decided that if Pete could talk to me, I must be okay. <laughs> I also realized that all New Yorkers didn't go to the Hamptons, as I thought from reading the New York Times. Also, that I didn't have to do, to, to re do research or answer the phone for the guys. Remember, this was before feminism, because he helped me to know that I was a writer too. For instance, I had made a list of everything New Yorkers did that made me afraid of them, like eating bloody steaks instead of brown pot roast, and confessing all their personal faults, but not doing anything about them. <laughs> In the Midwest, you either said nothing was wrong or you had to do something about it. This made Pete laugh and make a list of his own. Also, we both loved Bobby Kennedy, who so mysteriously became the Kennedy who identified with children and outsiders and the poor. After he was assassinated, and Pete was with him at that, in Los, at that Los Angeles rally, I think we both felt that part of our future had died with him. After New York Magazine, we saw each other rarely. I watched and cheered as he became a novelist, educator, artist. Everything that could never have been predicted, he was also the author of many more books than I, even though we are pretty much the same age. Pete is a master storyteller, and stories are the way we have always learned. We've been sitting around campfires for millennia, sharing experiences, empathizing, learning, discovering we are not alone. Our minds are organized by narrative. Yet now, so-called serious news is usually told in facts, numbers, and genera ger generalities. I think this may be why so many people become hooked on celebrities. They are the only narratives in town. We could learn from the ages, 
as my Native American friends say, tell me a fact and I'll forget. Tell me a story and I'll never forget. Pete Hamill is one of our best, deepest, most inclusive storytellers. He was a turning point in my life story. That's something I will never forget. Gloria Steinem. And one more in by way of Panama um, from Reuben Blades. Some people you meet, some people happen to you. From the very first time he appeared in my life, it was evident Pete Hamill owned some of the most important attributes a person can have. He was intelligent, curious, knowledgeable, kind, knew how to listen, had a sense of humor, and unlike the temporary occupant of that house in Washington, Pete managed to communicate his thoughts coherently and in complete sentences too. Isn't that something? <laughs> Through him, I met Paddy Chevesky and Jimmy Breslin. With him, I ate my first splints at the Carnegie Deli all along, wondering how could they avoid bankruptcy, judging by the size and content of their sandwiches. <laughs> I learned about New York because of Pete's constant effort to investigate all that was possible about his beloved city and was a happy recipient of his desire to share his information with as many people as he could. After a while, it dawned on me to bring a notebook and pen wherever we met to jot down his musings so that I would not forget. See that forget thing again? We talked about politics, sports, music, history, literature, world affairs, or rather, he talked, and I mostly listened, and as, I, and as it is said, widened my horizons. For me, it was a world when conversations were as important as daily nourishment. Something that impressed me instantly about Pete was how devoid of mannerisms and self-importance he was and still is. A person as comfortable at a table of longshoremen as with the so-called jet set. His personal ethic kept him real at all times and thus he could easily adapt to the environment at hand. All his working life is an example of a man ready to denounce injustice, ready to express solidarity with those in need of support, with the oppressed, the downtrodden. He said what he believed was needed to be said and damned the consequences. The Greeks, who have a term for everything, call it parhesia, the obligation to tell the truth for the common good, even at personal risk. Or, as Jimmy Breslin would put it, to say what you're not supposed to say, comma, if you're dumb. Pete Hamill is a writer, a raconteur, a bilingual editor of newspapers, a bona fide intellectual, but above all, he's a New Yorker from Brooklyn who has managed to give us and the world an example of what we can be and what we should do for one another, for an ideal of a more just and productive society. His life has been a light that keeps on shining no matter how dark times to let us know and remember not only what we are, but what we can become. This kind of soul is needed today more than ever it seems. That is why his example is so important to praise and to emulate. I join all them voices on this here night to thank you, Don Pedro Hamill. You are a New York institution and an example of what a true journalist and writer should be. Besides, a guy who can write a novel but still enjoy Jerry Robinson should be A-OK -okay in everybody's book. May God bless the Irish and you forever. What an honor it is to be considered your friend. All my best to Fukiko. You hit a jackpot there. Abrosis Grandes, Ruben Blades, Panama City. Thanks, Pete. And I'll now hand over to the great Mike Lupica. Well, James McBride stole my whole poem. Uh, <laughs> So I'm talking to Pete the other day, and, and he was talking about getting ready to write his, his speech for tonight, and he said, I, I, I have to cut our call short because I have to go get my hair cut. And I said, well, you, so you, you want to look good for, for the big night? And he said, no, I just don't want to show up looking like Steve Bannon. <laughs> Back in the 90s, uh, Pete had lung surgery. And they thought it was cancer, and it was not, but it was pretty invasive, and it was going to require a long period of recuperation. And 
So he called me up and he wanted to go somewhere warm and he, he decided on Florida. And I, I think Hyacin didn't take the call because when he saw it was from New York, he thought it might be Breslin, which uh, <laughs> generally meant that he just wanted you to drive him around for a couple of weeks. <laughs> so so, so uh, for spring training, we had a place in Jupiter that year. And I said, Pete, why don't you come there? And, and he did. And um, he would write and paint and paint in the morning, and then he, he had this, they had this amazing dog, uh, Gabo, who was like a, a superhero, and uh, Pete would take the dog out and throw a ball around, and then in the afternoons, we would go for walks. Almost every afternoon, we'd go for a walk. And, uh, and we would talk, but, but mostly, uh, I, I was happy to listen, because he would tell stories about growing up in Brooklyn, and, 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 and the old New York Post, and what it was like to be in the Ambassador Hotel that night when his friend Robert Kennedy was shot, and, and about a night that he had written about and would write about again when, when Sinatra called him up one night and said, what are you doing? And Pete said, nothing. And they rode around New York in the night and told stories. And, and he would tell me about the night he decided to quit drinking on New Year's Eve um, in 1972, which you would write beautifully about in, in A Drinking Life. Um, an, an event that he maintains was precipitated finally by listening to Buddy Greco sing Lulu's Back in Town. And uh, <laughs> he got up the next day and never had um, another drink. But it was like a master class in, in the thing that, that Pete has always said was to, the key to everything, which is living a life and not an apology, which he has done. Um, we started at the daily, there, there was a day in Florida, by the way, where I, where I took him up to Vero Beach. I, I, I told him it was time, he had to let go on the Dodgers thing. They had left in 57, and it was, <laughs> I, right, I, I said, come on, it's, it's time, it, we just <laughs> let it go. And, and, and we were talking to Tommy Lasorda, and he sees Roy Campanella um, down the right field line in his wheelchair. And so the child of Ebbets Field goes down, and, and there's Campy sitting in the shade, and Pete introduces himself, and Campanella says, you're from Brooklyn, aren't you? <laughs> and, and Pete said, yeah, how did you know that? And, and Campanella said, guys your age are always from Brooklyn. <laughs> And, and we, we started at the Daily News on the same day um, in 1977. And um, so I was able to walk through the door with, with a guy who had been this, this incredibly towering figure in my imagination from the time I was in college and used to go to the out-of-town newsstand in Harvard Square and get the New York Post to, to read Pete Hamill and, and, uh, and, and, and get to dream my own dreams. And, and the idea that I would ever get to work with him um, was, was beyond anything that I ever possibly could have dreamed. And then all of a sudden, 100 feet down the, the aisle from the sports department, there was Breslin and, and there was Hamill. And, and there was just all this incredible smoke, cigar smoke and cigarette smoke and, and, and magic um, in between them. He has been, um, a, a, I would love to say he's been a giant figure of my life, but he's been a giant figure in anybody who's lived in this city over the last half century. And, and he's, um, he, he, it's not just the genius he's had for, for words. Um, he has had a genius for, for friendship. He has had a genius, uh, he made his city better. He made newspapers better. He made anybody who ever got into his orbit better. And, and it, every time I would come back from one of those walks in the afternoon, I would feel better about things. Whatever's happening in the world, just listening to Pete, I would feel better. But, but apart from that, I felt like I was better. He made newspapers better. He made the city better with, with, this, with his talent, with his generosity, and, and his goodness. And it's, it, we celebrate that for all the years I've known him. Pete has always referred to an old-fashioned thing called grace. That's what, that's what we honor here tonight. That, that's what we celebrate here tonight. Pete Hamill's grace. And, um, you know, Pete, I'm going to, they always say steal from the best. 
so this is from A Drinking Life, page 218. And because, uh, you know, the old boxing promoter, Sam Silverman, used to say it's much better to be stolen from Pete than to have to steal, OK? <laughs> And this is Pete describing in a drinking life the moment when James Wexler at the old New York Post suggested that there might be a job for him and a career in newspapers. Page 218. Have you ever thought about becoming a newspaper man, he said. I mumbled something in reply, but I don't remember what. It must have been something like, only all my life. Well, Wexler said, call me in a couple of days and maybe I can get you a tryout around here. And at 1 a.m. on June 1st, 1960, I was back in that city room, clumsily disguised as a reporter. And my life changed forever. Well, plenty changed that night. Newspapers changed, his city changed. And it was the beginning of a career that has been distinguished by, by not just talent, but passion and honor and honesty. And doing one piece at a time what he used to do with me on those walks that we would take. Trying to make everything just a little bit better. And, and an old fashioned thing called grace. In Irrational Ravings, which is his magnificent first collection of columns, he talks about Jimmy Cannon. And he talks about Cannon suggesting that there was a time late at night when people tell each other the truth. Well, that hour has come a little earlier tonight at, at NYU. And, and we come here to tell the truth about my friend uh, Pete Hamill. And I'll just say this. Uh, our, our mutual friend, Elmore Leonard, said, um, Endings, man, they're much harder than you think. But actually, this tonight, for me, is, is quite easy. I will, I will end this the way I end every single phone conversation we have and simply say, I love you, Brother Pedro. Thank you very much. OK. I got to follow Lupica. I just want to uh, say that, uh, Pete, I love you too, and uh, here tonight, I don't know if you can see, but, but uh, Nick Pileggi is here, of course, Malachi, Peter Blauner, Eric Pooley, Ed Kosner, Julie Baumgold, Michael Daly, and it looks like Kriegel flew in from Hollywood. <laughs> so many, many people here to honor you tonight. Uh, my husband, George Rush, and I were honored to work for Pete when he was editor-in-chief of the uh, New York Daily News for eight bright, shining months in <laughs> 1997. Um, it was not easy being gossip columnists during Pete's tenure. Um, at the height of Donald Trump's split with Marla Maples, after a cop found her with her bodyguard on the beach in Florida at 4 o'clock in the morning, and uh, uh, we had the scoop, Pete would ask us, why do you want to write about the sordid vicissitudes of <laughs> Donald Trump's personal life all the time? He suffers from the hubris disease. <laughs> Instead of Trump ad infinitum, Pete had a different vision for the news. He serialized Norman Mailer's autobiography of Jesus for 19 weeks. <laughs> and dis remember that? And, d and despite the cacophony of pre-publicity about the auction of Princess Diana's dresses, she was uh, British. Uh, <laughs> Pete, Pete buried that story on page 34. I looked it up. Uh, while at Rupert Murdoch's New York Post, it ran on the wood and on to pages 2, 3, 4, and 5, much to news owner Mortimer Zuckerman's chagrin. Uh, growing up in the Bronx in the 1960s, I had learned early on that Pete was a chieftain. Now he was uh, editor-in-chieftain and who believed in the intelligence of working people 
whether they had been privileged with an education or not. Uh, even though he later associated with the highest echelons of uh, international intelligentsia, uh, telling us stories about Umberto and Vaclav, and, uh, he, Pete always spoke simple truths in complex times that people in both red or blue states of mind could relate to. I was taught this by my father who was searching for answers as his cousins and friends were being drafted to serve in Vietnam and some of them were not coming back. He found those answers in Pete's columns in the then liberal New York Post, which he read on the long ride home to the Bronx on the sixth local after full days of work and the night school right here at NYU. Our extended family's culture uh, was, as my great aunts would say, nish in a fa, -fa nish, whenever kids would come in, you know, clam up, there's kids around. But my father would sit down with me and make sure that I read Pete's columns and he would talk to me about them, like this one Pete wrote from Vietnam. Quote, I know this is no simple matter I know that for all the napalm we are dropping on the innocent, the Viet Cong are murdering others. I know that to live under communism is to not really live at all. But I wonder how many poets we have lost in anonymous jungles. How many of the lost young men might have cured cancer or written a symphony or run for president or played shortstop for the Mets or simply loved somebody else truly. A few years later, I was trying to sort out my own complex world as a teenage runaway. I had gotten on a Greyhound bus, yes, with a boy, <laughs> and headed west. I want any flyover people here to know that somewhere after Chicago, the cities just stop. <laughs> Minneapolis doesn't count. Uh, it was soybeans for miles, and when the boy said, we're here, I looked around and thought, where? <laughs> there was no bookstore, there was no coffee house, but I saw that, thank God, there was a movie theater. Unfortunately, it was playing the Apple Dumpling Gang with Don Knotts <laughs> and would do so for weeks. I would regularly go to the box office and ask, when are you gonna show One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest? Dog Day Afternoon is out, when are you gonna show it? And the answer was never. Should I run away from where I'd run away to? There was only one person who could advise me in this dire situation. I wrote to the chieftain, Pete. He didn't know me from Adam, but I felt that I knew him. I told him all about the town and that not only did the movie theater not have any plans to show the upcoming Woody Allen movie, Love and Death, but that they had never shown a Woody Allen movie at all. One day, I opened my rural mailbox to find a, le a letter that fairly glowed. It was from the village vo voice, sorry. I tore it open and emblazoned on Pete Hamill's station stationery were big exuberant letters like headlines. Pete had written, Joanna, don't despair out there, <laughs> write. Write about it all, just like you wrote to me. Send me your dispatches and we can publish them in The Voice. <laughs> that was enough encouragement for me for a lifetime. Thank you, Pete. And now I'll nish nish and fa fa nish and shut up. <laughs> And I was just looking up and down the aisle here, and uh, you probably heard that Patrick Kavanaugh, the great unheard of Irish poet in between Heaney and Yeats, uh, he, he once said that uh, the standing army of Irish poets never falls below 20,000. <laughs> and I'm looking at this stage of distinguished men and women, and it reminds me of talking with Michael Daly one day about uh, sometime in the 90s. We were walking along the street, and I, I was saying to Michael that the standing, Irish, the standing army of Irish-American columnists seems to be at its peak. And Michael said, what else are we going to do? 
I don't see any of us playing for the Knicks. <laughs> So, you know, so speaking of the Knicks, just about the best place to follow them in 1972 was in the pages of the New York Post, a well-known liberal rag. I picked up that post, the Post that year, be, not because of its politics, but because the Knicks were on their way to a second championship. It is their most recent. And, <laughs> and uh, the Post was covering the hell out of it. So reading back to front, I began to see the work of writers with voice, with ideas, with a sense of humor. Mary McGrory, Art Buckwald, William Buckley, Murray Kempton, Pete Hamill. This was something new. And then those pre-internet days, if you wanted to go back and savor something a second time, you had to clip and save the physical thing. You had to save it. And you, you'd want to put it somewhere safe. And if you happened to be 15 years old in 1972, that would be a wiro bound composition book, 54 sheets, wide rule, available for 39 cents from F.W. Woolworth and Company. And if you had told that 15-year-old that nearly a half century later, he'd be on a stage reading from that very notebook, well, maybe he'd believe you. <laughs> or maybe not. All I know, all I knew then and all I know now is those were things worth keeping. From a column, June 4th, 1974, titled simply, Heroes. Harold Hoey, a young black guy, said, well, let's see, was he a ball player? An older woman asked if Harold Hoey lived in the building next door. Another man said he thought he was a politician, but every one of them had heard of Henry Kissinger. That's the way the world rewards the true heroes. Now, just a little backfill here. It had been a large week in the life of Harold Hoey. He had gotten a medal for saving the lives of a teenage girl and an older woman in a building up in the Bronx that was on fire. He was a firefighter, obviously. And a day or so later, at another blaze, his cherry picker jostled him when he was four stories high, sent him pitching backwards. And at Jacoby Hospital, his wife made the decision to donate his skin for a graft. But there was more about that moment. Congress had just strong-armed into a vote of been just had just been strong-armed into a vote of confidence for Henry Kissinger. He had made the cover of Time and Newsweek. Harold Hoey was on page 37 of the Post in Pete's column. It concludes, Harold Hoey dies without magazine covers, without parades, without a platitude or two from some cheap politician. But I know this, a hundred Henry Kissingers would not make one Harold Hoey. Kissinger believes in history, believes in its icy abstractions and the rights of history makers to kill or maim in the name of large propositions. But Harold Hoey believed in life. He gave life to people on the streets of the meanest parts of this town. He let people breathe and grow and taste the wonders of this poor earth. We can struggle through somehow without Kissinger, but it's a tough, hard day when we lose Harold Hoey. I'll skip over the lion's head story. Dan Barry stole it already. <laughs> it's axiomatic. Of course, as eventually I did meet Pete as a grown up, more or less. Uh, and, you know, it's axiomatic that newspaper columnists do not look anything like the tiny little postage stamp picture that runs with the column. It's usually taken right after their first communions. <laughs> and uh, a week before Social Security kicks in, they're still running it. I, look, I, you probably can't see this, but that's Hamill up there. I just want to mention, 
that you look at him tonight, every hair is just where he left it when the Post snapped that picture in 1964. <laughs> New York City in the 1970s was at times a brutal pl place, but it was painted far too often in jury hues. Often, it must be said, because the people who lived there were of different tones than the ones doing the painting. The state of siege politically, socially, financially, culturally seemed constant in those years. But you don't want despair when you're young. Joanna found that out. Anger, yeah. Passion, empathy. I would pick up Hamill and read how he saw in the growing new New York the kin and heirs of his own immigrant parents. Anyone who has watched Casablanca no doubt remembers the moment when the Nazi officers at Rick's Cafe begin to sing Watch on the Rhine. And then the heroic resistance fighter Victor Laszlo walks up to the band and says, play La Marseillaise. And his solitary voice begins the anthem and soon it has lifted the entire cafe with his glorious song and voice, drowning out the Nazis. That, for me, was Pete Hamill in the New York of the 1970s, a voice that cleared the air and told the truth. He gave you hope. So I ended up working with Hamill in a couple of places. Uh, and when he was the editor of the news for those hot eight months, I, I ran into the office one day and I said, look, I've got some really hot story. I don't remember what it was. It was really a, I wanted to write about it. It was not my day to write. We had scheduled days. I was Monday, Wednesday, Friday or something, Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday, one of those deals. And this was an off day. And I said, I'd like to write an extra column. Pete said, sure. I said, well, but it won't be as long as usual. No problem, said Pete. I said, maybe just 500 words. I said, sure, said Pete. And if you don't have enough time, write 1,000. <laughs> <laughs> the, so I don't have enough time. But uh, there's another axiom that's sort of a corollary to the one about the headshot not resembling the picture. So never meet your heroes. So years after I 